In March of 363 C, a sizable Roman army set out from Antioch to begin the Persian campaign. Julian, a member of the esteemed Constantinian family, was in his third year as the Roman emperor and eager to prove himself. He was no stranger to politics or military strategy, having already demonstrated his abilities by fighting the barbarians prior to taking the throne. In 357, his impressive victories in Gaul earned him the admiration and loyalty of his troops, but also drew the jealousy of his relative, Emperor Constantius II. When Constantius ordered the Gallic army to join his Persian campaign, the soldiers rebelled and declared Julian their emperor. Constantius' untimely death in 360 averted a civil war, leaving Julian as the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Despite his victories in the West, Julian inherited a deeply divided army upon taking the throne. The Eastern legions and their commanders remained loyal to the late emperor, creating a dangerous division within the imperial army that would play a role in Julian's decision to travel to Tessaphon. If he could win a decisive battle in the East like Galerius before him, Julian would have gained much-needed prestige and strengthened his legitimacy. A triumph in the East could also help Julian pacify his subjects. In the spring of 363 C, a large Roman army departed from Antioch, marking the beginning of Julian's ambitious Persian campaign to fulfill a centuries-old Roman dream, defeating and humiliating its Persian nemesis. Unfortunately, Julian would never see the great city again. In addition to the emperor's aspirations for glory and prestige, there were also practical advantages to defeating the Sassanids in their homeland. Julian aimed to put an end to Persian raids, establish stability along the eastern border, and potentially acquire additional territories from his challenging neighbors. Most significantly, a resounding triumph could create an opening for him to place his own nominee on the Sassanid throne. Hormistus, the exiled brother of Shapur II, accompanied the Roman army on their mission. Following the Battle of Caere where the Roman commander Crassus met his demise centuries prior, Julian's army divided into two groups. A smaller force, consisting of approximately 16,000 to 30,000 soldiers, proceeded to join Armenian troops under Arsaces for a diversionary attack from the north towards Tigris. Meanwhile, the main army, totaling around 60,000 soldiers and led by Julian himself, advanced southward along the Euphrates towards the coveted prize of Sassanid's capital Tessaphon. When the army reached Colonicum, a crucial fort on the lower Euphrates, they encountered a vast fleet. According to Amianus Marcellinus, the river flotilla included more than a thousand supply ships and fifty war galleys. Additionally, specialized vessels were constructed to serve as pontoon bridges. After passing the border fort of Circesium, which marked Julian's last stop in Roman territory, the army crossed into Persia. At the start of the Persian campaign, Julian implemented an ancient blitzkrieg strategy with great success. Thanks to his strategic route choices, the army was able to move quickly and use deception to advance into enemy territory with minimal resistance. Over the following weeks, the Roman army captured several major towns, leaving destruction in their wake. Although the garrison of Anatha surrendered, the town was still burned by the Romans. Pyrrhusabora, the second largest city in Mesopotamia after Tessaphon, also fell after a two or three day siege and was subsequently destroyed. The citadel's capture allowed Julian to restore the royal canal, which facilitated the transfer of the fleet from the Euphrates to the Tigris. As they encountered flooding created by the Persians to slow their advance, the Roman army had to rely on pontoon bridges. Additionally, the imperial legions laid siege to and captured the fortified city of Meazomolcha, the last stronghold standing before Tessaphon. As May's oppressive heat descended upon the region, Julian's campaign continued to progress smoothly. However, to avoid a long and grueling war in the sweltering Mesopotamian climate, Julian knew that he needed to act quickly. He made the decision to strike directly at Tessaphon hoping that the fall of the Sassanid capital would force Shapur to seek peace. As the Roman army approached Tessaphon, they encountered Persian attacks that exposed their supply train to hostile raids. Despite this, there was still no sign of Shapur's main army. 
A large Persian force was spotted outside Meosamulcha, but quickly retreated, leaving Julian and his generals to wonder if they were being led into a trap. They remained nervous and wary, questioning whether or not Shapur was reluctant to engage them. As the emperor finally arrived at his much-desired destination, he couldn't help but feel a growing sense of unease. The once impenetrable canal that safeguarded Tessifin had been drained and blocked off, but the mighty Tigris River still posed a daunting challenge to overcome, and even if the Romans managed to cross, they would still have to face a formidable garrison of thousands of spearmen and the legendary cataphracts, the mail-clad cavalry. The exact number of defenders was unknown, but according to our primary source and eyewitness, Amianus, they presented an impressive sight. Despite facing numerous setbacks, Julian persisted in his preparations. He believed that by winning the battle at Tessifin, he could bring the campaign to a triumphant conclusion and return to Rome as a conquering hero, much like Alexander the Great. With a renewed sense of determination, the emperor ordered his troops to refill the canal and prepare for a daring night attack. Several ships were dispatched to establish a foothold on the other side of the Tigris River, but the Persians, who controlled the high ground, put up a fierce fight. They showered the legionaries with flaming arrows and hurled clay jugs filled with naphtha at the ship's wooden decks. Despite the initial setback, the Romans pressed on, with more ships crossing the river as the fighting intensified. After a long and grueling battle, the Romans finally secured the beachhead and pushed forward, determined to claim victory. The Battle of Tessifin was a momentous clash that took place on a vast, open plain that stretched out before the imposing walls of the city. The commander of the Sassanid forces, a skilled strategist named Shurna, deployed his troops in a manner that was typical of his era. The bulk of his army was made up of heavily armored infantry, who were positioned in the center of the formation. On either side of these stalwart soldiers, Shurna placed a mix of light and heavy cavalry, whose task it was to protect the flanks and provide support where needed. One of the most striking features of the Persian army was the presence of mighty war elephants, which were used to great effect on the battlefield and no doubt left a lasting impression on the Roman soldiers facing them. The Roman army, in contrast, was primarily composed of skilled heavy infantry, who were backed up by smaller detachments of elite mounted soldiers. To add to their strength, the Romans enlisted the aid of their Saracen allies, who provided them with much-needed light cavalry. Despite their formidable reputation and battle-hardened troops, the Romans faced a daunting challenge in the face of Shurna's well-organized and well-equipped army. The battle between the Romans and the Persians was a sight to behold. The Romans started the fight by launching their javelins, which were met with a barrage of arrows from the Persian archers, both mounted and on foot. The arrows were aimed to soften the enemy's center, but the Roman army was prepared for this tactic. The Persians then sent in their heavy cavalry, the cataphracts, who were known for their mail-clad armor and terrifying charges that often caused their opponents to break lines and flee before the horsemen could reach them. However, the Roman army, with their good morale and preparation, offered strong resistance, and the Sassanid attack ultimately failed. Emperor Julian played a significant role in this victory. He rode through the friendly lines, reinforcing weak points, praising brave soldiers, and castigating the fearful, which boosted the morale of the Roman army. The cataphracts, who were armored from head to toe, along with their horses, were a significant threat, but the sweltering heat lessened their impact. The Roman soldiers were able to drive the Persian cavalry and elephants from the battlefield, which led to the entire enemy line buckling and giving way to the Romans. The Persians retreated behind the city gates, while the Romans emerged victorious from the battle. Amianus reports that the Battle of Tessaphon saw a staggering loss of over 2,000 Persian soldiers, while the Roman army lost a mere 70 brave soldiers. Although Julian emerged victorious in the battle, 
His strategy failed in the long run. A heated debate ensued between Julian and his staff, as the Roman army, though in good shape, lacked the necessary siege equipment to take over the city of Tessaphon. Even if they managed to breach the walls, they would still have to face the city's reinforced garrison, comprised of those who had survived the fierce battle. Adding to their worries, Shapur's army, which was significantly larger than the one they had just defeated, was closing in on them at a rapid pace. Despite conducting unsuccessful sacrifices that some viewed as a bad omen, Julian made a fateful decision. He ordered all the ships to be burned, and the Roman army embarked on a perilous journey through the hostile terrain of the Persian territory.